we go. All right, I'm back. And let's talk about the Neoproterozoic. Um, so the Neoproterozoic is broken into three time periods. As you can see, the oldest is the Tonian, and then we have the Cryogenian, and then the Ediacaran. And um, um, cryo refers to ice, so we're going to be visiting another ice age. But let's start by looking at tectonics of this time. We get Rodinia assembling. And our Rodinian supercontinent is assembled by about 900 million years ago. And most of this content, a content, continent was sitting at the equator. It was equatorial. And uh, it stuck around for about 300 million years and then again started breaking apart. And at this time, an ocean called the Iapetus Ocean begins forming between Laurentia, Baltica, and Abalonia. So Laurentia is North America, Baltica is basically Europe, and Abalonia is a terrain, and a terrain is kind of a, a smaller continent or uh, an island arc or some, some it's not as big as a, a real continent. Uh, and in any case, uh, this ocean starts forming between those land masses. So that's what we're taking a look at here. We have uh, Laurentia, and we have Baltica, and we have Amazonia, and so we're just going to start getting this um, Iapetus Ocean forming as those things split apart from each other. But one of the weirdest things, or most amazing things, in the Neoproterozoic is something called Snowball Earth. Now, there is a little bit of debate over Snowball Earth. Some people call it Slush Ball Earth. And what the difference is, some people think the entire surface of the planet was completely covered by ice. And so we have even evidence of ice in tropical areas. Other people, the ones in the Slush Ball Earth camp, think that most of the Earth was covered by ice, but maybe like in the equatorial ocean there wasn't any uh, sea ice. Now, eh, you know, it is a debate, and we don't know for sure, but what we do know absolutely positively is it was bloody cold at this point in time. And so we have ice pretty much covering at least almost the entire planet, if not all of it, and we have quite a bit of evidence of ice in the tropics. And while people sort of talk about Snowball Earth as though it's one event, it's very much like uh, any other ice age where there are pulses where it's extra cold and then it kind of warms up and then it's extra cold again. And we have three major cold pulses, the Sturgeon, the Marinoan, and the Gaskiers. And um, this earliest one is not the best dated, so these are the best estimates that I, uh, that I have for it. Um, the others are pretty well dated to, as you can see, you know, 585 million year, um, uh, yeah, million years ago, 660 million years ago, and so on. Now, right on top of these deposits from Snowball Earth, and Snowball Earth deposits are going to be very typical glacial deposits. You're going to see tillites. You're going to see glacial drop stones and ocean deposits. But right on top of those glacial deposits, we have these things called cap carbonates. Cap because they're like capping the glacial deposits. And they indicate a sudden shift to warmer climates because carbonate rocks don't form when it's really, really cold. And this is almost like a switch turn where it was really, really cold and, and we have this snowball earth and then boom, it's warm again. And that's what we're looking at right here. Notice this is till. See how it's very uh, unsorted. We have all kinds of different rocks there. And then right above it, that's our cap carbonate located there. And seeing an event like this in Earth's history makes geologists start thinking, well, why, why would it happen? What caused Snowball Earth? And there are a number of ideas. Maybe we had some very large volcanic eruptions. Lots of ash in the atmosphere, lots of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere can block incoming sunlight. You block incoming sunlight, it's going to cool things. 
Maybe there is lower solar output. And that's actually not even a maybe. We know the sun did not give off as much energy back uh, in, in this time period. So maybe that lower solar output helped cause this. Um, a reduction in greenhouse gases. The whole reason why Earth is above freezing today is because we have greenhouse gases. If we got rid of all of the greenhouse gases, Earth's average global temperature would be something below the freezing point of water. And uh, so it would be pretty chilly. Um, so maybe there was some kind of reduction in greenhouse gases. Or maybe because, remember I said the continents are kind of sitting at the, equa uh, at the equator? And land and water absorb and reflect light in different ways. Albedo is how much light gets reflected. And so it's thought maybe with all of the continents sitting in, at the equator, that changed how much of the sun's energy was absorbed and how much was reflected. And um, if a lot more is reflected than absorbed, then you can end up having um, a cooling trend. Do we know which one of these exactly did it? Hopefully someone's saying no out there. Uh, and in fact, it's probably a combination of uh, a few of these. We do have a pretty good idea though, why Snowball Earth ends. Um, and this comes down to carbon dioxide from volcanoes. So when all of this ice ends up covering Earth, there's one thing that's not going to be going on as much, and that's photosynthesis, right? If we have ice even covering much of the world's oceans, we're not going to be having like uh, algae and stuff photosynthesizing. And the way photosynthesis works is it takes out carbon dioxide, gives off oxygen. So if we decrease photosynthesis, we're going to decrease the amount of CO2 taken out of the atmosphere. But during Snowball Earth, volcanoes just keep doing their normal thing. So they continue to give off this CO2. So now we have plenty of CO2 being emitted, but there's not that balance of photosynthesis taking it out of the atmosphere. And without that balance, we get a massive buildup of carbon dioxide from the volcanoes, and this basically tips the Earth away from Snowball Earth and warms it once again. Now, I also wrote that there's a limited amount of silicate mineral weathering. Silicate, the weathering of silicate minerals also takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And if everything's covered by ice, we're not going to be having a whole lot of chemical weathering going on, and so we, we're even limiting that um, uh, place where CO2 could, could be going. And so while we don't know exactly the beginnings of Snowball Earth, we do have a pretty good idea of how it ends. Now what about life? So far we've just been talking about the physical world of the Paleoproterozoic and Meso- and Neoproterozoic. Well, life undergoes some interesting changes in, uh, in these time periods. So in the Paleoproterozoic, life is very similar to the Archean, which means we have lots and lots of cyanobacteria creating those nice stromatolites. So we're still in the age when stromatolites ruled the earth. And uh, they're really, really common. But at the end they, of the Proterozoic, they do start declining. Uh, we also have a lot of prokaryotic plankton around in the Paleoproterozoic. And um, of course, those extremophiles are just like today, they're hanging out in those extreme environments of hot springs and deep ocean areas and rocks and stuff like that. As we go through the Mesoproterozoic into the Neoproterozoic, the eukaryotes show up and diversify. We have this major diversification of eukaryotes from about 1 to 1.2 billion years ago. And we also start seeing some of the first metazoan. Well, what's a metazoan? A metazoan is a large multicellular organism. 
So now we're not just looking at these single cell tiny microscopic, microscopic things. We now have life that's visible without a microscope and it's made from numerous cells working together. A great place um, that has been studied to see some of this proterozoic life is the gunflint chert. Remember from uh, um, my previous lectures, chert is very fine grained so it can uh, preserve those teeny tiny little fossils. And this gunflint chert dates to about 1.9 billion years ago and there are uh, many well preserved prokaryotes in there. And some of these resemble modern algae, so they probably belong to the same groups that this modern algae belong to. Some resemble modern iron and magnesium reducing bacteria. Um, and then some resemble absolutely nothing we know of today. So that's obviously some line that um, went extinct. Um, we also, a neat part of this, is that there are preserved organic compounds in this chert that result from the breakdown of chlorophyll. So we do know that um, photosynthesis is definitely occurring at this point in time. And here you can see some of the fossil organisms that uh, were preserved in uh, the gunflint chert. These are actually um, uh, images taken, uh, microscope images. These are some sketches of some little uh, creatures. Now, in the Proterozoic, we also have a group of organisms called the acrotarchs, and they become quite common. Um, they're small. Again, we're looking at microscopic things. You can see the sizes of them, and those are micrometers. Uh, ooh, look, there's a typo. Okay, the earliest um, are known from 1.6 billion years ago. They were really, really abundant and diverse around 850 million years ago. And then by about 657 million years ago, they were mostly extinct, although a few hang on um, for a while after that. They, some of them hang on actually for a couple hundred million years. Um, but these things have lots of weird looks to them. Um, we have Pac-Man there. This one bizarrely looks kind of like the coronavirus. Um, it's much bigger though and it's not a virus. But um, you know they had different shapes and they're just like a, a weird thing that was uh, abundant in the Proterozoic. One of the life forms or some of the life forms that are just absolutely fascinating from this time though belong to something called the Ediacaran fauna. Anytime we use this word fauna, that means group of animals. And the Ediacaran fauna are named for the Ediacara Hills in South Australia, where this group of fossils, this group of animals was first identified. And these guys lived from about 635 to 542 million years ago. And uh, they were soft bodied. So we're not talking about organisms that have shells or teeth or anything like that. And so they're preserved basically as imprints in uh, fine grained sediments. And they have many different shapes to them. Discoidal, discoidal means kind of, well, like a disc. So sort of round and flat. Um, some are frond like, meaning kind of like a feather. Uh, some are elongate, like worms would look like. There's one that's called Kimberella, and um, it appears, when you really study it, that it has a body cavity. So it had kind of an internal cavity that might have had uh, some sort of digestive or other types of internal organs. And paleontologists think Kimberella might have had what's called a mantle. Now, mantle is a specialized part of a mollusk that is what eventually will start making their shells. So it looks like Kimberella might have been sort of a predecessor to some of these much more complex organisms. Um, there is, however, debate about how related these are to modern phyla. We don't really know if they 
belong in the groups we see today. Some of them do appear, like Kimberella, could possibly belong with the mollusks. And there's other ones that could possibly belong with annelids. Annelids are worms, segmented worms. But uh, there's still a lot of debate among paleontologists where these things belong. Uh, they show up after one of the glaciations, the Maranoan glaciation of Snowball Earth. And they become abundant after the Gasquiers glaciation. And while they were um, discovered in South Australia, uh, they can also be found, uh, there's Ediacaran uh, organisms and fossils found in China, in Canada, uh, somewhere in Africa I think there's one as well, but I've never visited that one so don't really know. Um, and here's an artist's rendition of what these organisms likely looked like. There's some of our discoidal ones. There's one that looks sort of like a worm. This is that frond-like one. That's Kimberella, the one that might have had internal organs. I don't know what the garlic-looking things did, but hey, they're kind of cool. So these down here are the fossils that are preserved, and these are what we think those organisms then looked like. And these are some of the actual fossils. These are taken from a place called Mistaken Point, which is in Newfoundland, Canada. That's why you have a Canadian quarter there for, um, for scale. And this was like a, a little suction-y holdfast. So that thing that would hold it onto the ground. And there's part of the frond uh, of that organism. And this is uh, one of the like wormy things that uh, um, would have lived on the sea floor at that time. Now, that's life in, uh, in the Proterozoic. Um, a couple other important things to remember about the Proterozoic is that this time period is significantly changing from the Archean. The oxygen sinks become saturated. An oxygen sink is, a, is uh, like a mineral or something that wants to bond with the oxygen and take it out of the atmosphere. Well, everything that wanted to bond with the oxygen that was being created by photosynthesis has already bonded. And so that means now oxygen can start building up in Earth's atmosphere. And as it builds up in Earth's atmosphere, it's also going to start um, building up in the oceans. The oceans will get oxygenated. And oxygen in the sea combined, combined with nitrogen to produce nitrate, which is a very important nutrient for algae. So we're really seeing the sea kind of becoming a, a nicer place for certain groups to live in. And we start seeing red beds. Red beds are those reddish colored sandstones that form on the continents and they can only form in an oxygenated environment. So we know that we're starting to get plenty of oxygen in, uh, in the atmosphere at this time. I do like to finish my lectures of the different time periods with things like other weird facts. Just stuff that I think is neat and wanted to tell you about. So let's look at other weird facts about the Proterozoic. Earth used to spin much faster than it does today. What happens, about every 100,000 years, two seconds are lost due to tidal friction. Remember we have the rise and fall of tides due to the gravitational attraction of the sun and the moon, and so there's friction between that water and the earth, and that actually slows earth down two seconds every 100,000 years. So if we would travel back in time to the Neoproterozoic, instead of having 24 hours in a day, you'd have 18.2 hours in a day. But I bet our bosses would still want us to work like, what, 24 of them. Um, but anyway, days were a lot, um, a lot, less, they were a lot shorter then, which means I think I'm a lot older then? I don't know, but anyway, there we go. And that's our random picture of the day. This is Mistaken Point in Newfoundland. And if you notice, I'm wearing these weird little booties. That is not how I normally leave the house. However, to try to protect the fossils, which are found all across the surface of the rocks here, you're not allowed to wear your shoes out there, and you have to wear these special little booties to go and visit it. So there you go. So that's the uh, Proterozoic, and I hope you guys are having a great time, and remember to ask any questions if you have them.